Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our um, summer version of Virtual Medical Grand Rounds. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we actually have uh, a little bit of a celebrity uh, presenting uh, at Grand Rounds today. Um, I think it's important for us to actually have uh, a little bit of background in terms of treatment, even though we know it's not available yet, but it's coming very quickly, I hope. And, and I know Dr. Gote is gonna talk about that a little bit, um, but uh, we're, we are gonna be talking about remdesivir today. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthias Gote from our um, Department of Microbiology. Dr. Gote obtained his PhD degree at Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Germany. He um, started his independent research program in 2000, following a postdoc at the Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research in Montreal. He later joined the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at McGill and was promoted to full professor in 2011. Um, in Dr. Gote's lab, the research is focused on the study of viral replication, its inhibition and mechanisms associated with drug resistance. His interests cover a broad range of important human pathogens, including RNA viruses with a high um, epidemic potential. So um, Dr. Uh, Gote's lab results have contributed to significant knowledge, the development of novel classes of viral polymerase inhibitors, and his team has elucidated the mechanism of action of the investigational drug remdesivir, which is now used in several countries to treat COVID-19, not in Canada yet, um, with severe disease. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Matthias Gote. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kassam, for, for inviting me and for um, giving us the opportunity also to talk a little bit about our own data. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about uh, remdesivir today um, from Ebola to emergency use authorization um, for the treatment of uh, COVID-19. And uh, it's a little bit of a historic um, um, yeah, background that I intend to provide um, together with uh, a literature review, uh, the latest data, uh, including also um, our own data. The disclaimer here, you can see I uh, received funding from Gilead Sciences for mechanistic studies on remdesivir. So the objectives of the presentation today uh, in greater detail is uh, I tried to um, um, provide uh, information on the discovery um, of remdesivir. Um, I discussed the spectrum of antiviral um, activities, um, preclinical data, the mechanism of action, and at the very end also um, about uh, clinical trials. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of um, my background, I studied chemistry and uh, biochemistry, as uh, Dr. Kassam mentioned, and eventually I wound up in Montreal in uh, 1997, did a postdoc there and uh, um, started up my lab at uh, McGill. And um, my mentor was uh, the late uh, Dr. Mark Weinberg. Uh, he was our Mr. HIV AIDS, as, as many of you perhaps remember and know here in Canada, he was one of the first who was uh, who started to work with uh, the HIV uh, virus. And uh, he, he's very well known also for um, assessing treatments in, in, the, in the early 90s and uh, especially also Lamivudine 3 tc that was, of course, and still is um, heavily used in the treatment of HIV. Um, I started up my lab in, in uh, 2000 and we branched out to hepatitis C and we, we've been working on this for 15 years or so and uh, always with the, the heavy focus on the polymerases of these uh, two viruses, the reverse transcriptase of HIV and the NS5B RNA dependent RNA polymerase of hepatitis C. Um, these are clearly the prime targets um, uh, in drug discovery and development efforts, um, very logical targets. I refer to these enzymes as engines of, of the virus and most of the antivirals that are approved, um, is it against HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, um, even uh, DNA viruses, herpes viruses, these are all 
um, polymerase inhibitors. Of, of course, there are other important targets um, like proteases and, and so forth, but the polymerase is for sure a validated um, 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 important uh, target. So we, we sort of stopped working on HIV and hepatitis C because we felt we couldn't contribute anymore to the drug discovery and development process. The drugs were just so good. There was no issue or less of an issue with regards to drug resistance. And we used to be interested in, um, in, in mechanisms of drug resistance and how can we improve actually the drugs that they also work against resistant strains. But with the uh, new, newer generations of antiviral drugs also for hepatitis C, for instance, sofosbuvir, there's there's almost uh, resistance. The, the problem of resistance is is almost non-existent. Um, so we thought when we moved here um, about six years ago um, to Edmonton, relocated the lab and um, having a fresh start with uh, other viruses and probably with more, uh, at least from a biochemical perspective, more uh, significant approach. And we started to work on on. Ebola and and other viruses where we do not have um, at that point in time um, adequate uh, treatment, and you see uh, on this slide emerging viruses over the last a uh, hundred years is is and 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 will probably always be a huge problem. Um, just about a hundred years ago, to the left here, you can see the Spanish flu roughly 50 million deaths. Um, you see a bunch of other um, influenza um, viruses, outbreaks, um, and we still do not have um, very good countermeasures, uh, at least not in terms of, uh, of treatment. And I, I come to that point a little bit later. Um, you see on top, of course, uh, HIV. Um, you see other viruses like uh, Nipah, NEPA is, is, is an important one. The outbreaks um, are, um, case fatality is, is almost uh, 100%. That's what we learned also um, in the beginning of, of last year. So far, the outbreaks are relatively small, but uh, that can be a huge problem. Of course, we all remember um, SARS in 2002 and MERS, both coronaviruses. And um, 17 years of, of research, unfortunately, and, 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 and this is really, um, I, I should say, terrible right now, we do not have an adequate uh, treatment. We don't have antiviral drugs. And that was, uh, um, I, I think, really a missed opportunity. Um, I should say, though, that the research done on SARS and MERS is extremely helpful right now um, for for us working and, and, and many others in the field of drug discovery and development, we're using the tools that were developed over these uh, 17 or 18 years. And many of those tools in terms of um, enzyme expression, cell culture, animal models, and so forth um, can be adapted to, to SARS-2. So in that regard, um, uh, that past research on SARS and MERS was really um, a success. However, we, we didn't cross the finish line, which was um, a major problem. Now, uh, 2014 and also 2018 and 19, there were a couple of Ebola outbreaks and certainly the one in 2014 um, in West Africa um, was uh, an eye opener. Um, 11,000 uh, uh, people died and uh, uh, the whole world, I guess, panicked at, at that point in time that it could spread also all over. Um, that was eventually uh, not the case, uh, but still it was a terrible outbreak. And of course, um, the WHO, uh, United States, Put a, many other countries as well put a lot of effort into um, a better management of um, epidemics uh, like that. So the WHO started to work on the so-called blueprint, um, yeah, to better to be able to better deal with uh, these type of outbreaks, and um, they came up with uh, a, a list of priori priority diseases um, where 
um, at that point in time, there was almost um, no, uh, very little research. Um, of course, influenza and RSV, these are two viruses that are not listed here, and they are not listed um, here because uh, there, there, there was and is still a lot of uh, research ongoing. But, but these type of viruses that are listed here, including Crimean Congo, many of you probably never heard of that virus, uh, Ebola, Lassa, um, and so forth, Nipah, um, there was little research going on and absolutely no countermeasures in terms of uh, uh, treatment. Um, and vaccine, there was progress, but it was not commercialized at that point in time. You can see also that coronaviruses were listed here as well, MERS and SARS. So um, in the aftermath or, or during the 2014 outbreak, um, Gilead, the CDC, and you, Samred, um, collaborated, and uh, the goal was to identify antivirals with a broad spectrum of antiviral activity. The focus here was also clearly on Ebola because there was just no drug available. Um, so Gilead has a large library. Gilead has a history um, uh, for with uh, nucleotide, nucleotide analog inhibitors for the treatment of uh, HIV, HBV, and, and hepatitis C. And they have a large library, and the library was uh, screened at the CDC. And um, with this screen, um, there was this compound identified, GS441524, um, that was potent against um, Ebola. Later on, um, Yosemrit and Gilead has a ton of experience in, in that regard. They made a prodrug of this version, and that was later called uh, remdesivir. And uh, I will later on also explain the chemical details. Um, just now on this slide, the um, antiviral activity of remdesivir um, against uh, Ebola, and you can see here different uh, cell types, um, and you can see um, the um, um, pro prodrug remdesivir and um, the um, nucleoside analog. Um, you can see expressed in EC50 values micromolar that usually remdesivir um, is a little bit better than um, the um, parent compound, and the reason for that is the um, chemical additions that make it a prodrug actually facilitate the bioavailability, cellular uptake, and so forth. So nucleosides per se are really not well um, um, taken up by, by the cell. They are polar, negatively charged, and uh, that is the problem. So a prodrug approach like um, also with sofosbuvir or with tenofovir um, um, made this particular drug um, more potent. And um, here, just uh, very briefly, let's go over the intracellular uh, metabolic pathway. I should say from, from the get-go here, if we are dealing with nucleoside or nucleotide analog inhibitors, we assume that these compounds target the polymerase, the viral polymerase. And this is what you can see on the bottom to the right. The, the active compound is always the triphosphate. And uh, the triphosphate of uh, a nucleotide analog inhibitor like remdesivir competes with its natural counterpart. In this case, it is uh, ATP uh, for incorporation and uh, um, into the growing RNA chain. So the issue is that you cannot use the triphosphate form. It's negatively charged. It will never go in the cell. Um, so you have to start a little bit earlier uh, with a, a, a trick, a prodrug approach um, like uh, uh, remdesivir. And to the left, um, uh, you can see that the monophosphate here is mass and inside the cell. Um, this is hydrolyzed and leaves the monophosphate, which is eventually in the cell, um, phosphorylated to the triphosphate form. Um, so that's the trick. You use a prodrug to bypass the issue um, 
with uh, cellular uptake. And you also bypass the first phosphorylation step from here to here, which is usually slow and rate limiting. So it's a, it's a, it's a very tricky construct, if, if you wish, and Gilead has a, a ton of experience in that, and, and that was also um, demonstrated over the years. Um, now, in 2016, there was the first, in my opinion, significant uh, publication on remdesivir. Um, there were some chemical papers prior to that, but uh, this was a big one. This was a, a nature paper, therapeutic efficacy of the small molecule at that point in time, GS57 or 34, so remdesivir, against Ebola virus in uh, rhesus uh, monkeys. And um, just um, I picked here an, an important finding. This is the, um, uh, they looked into um, 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 monkeys, um, infected the monkeys, and then treated after a couple of days. And then they looked for survival. Um, and they also looked for um, plasma viremia, or viral load. And um, you can see here in color, different red and green, um, remdesivir um, treatment or treated uh, monkeys survival was much higher with uh, the treated uh, uh, cohorts as compared to the uh, vehicle or, or non-treated ones. Um, and you can also see that this also correlates with uh, decreases in viral load or plasma viremia. So that was a pretty good result. Um, and um, we were just wondering, my lab at that point in time, how does it actually work, remdesivir? And it's, it is not so trivial um, because of all the modifications um, that, uh, that, that, that are highlighted in this slide here. So I discussed already the prodrug version. This is here number um, five. This is really to mask the negatively charged phosphate and to get remdesivir inside the cell. Um, number one is an interesting one here. This is the three prime hydroxyl group. So the three prime hydroxyl group is absolutely required for um, RNA synthesis. So in other words, if remdesivir, is, if this compound is really incorporated into the newly synthesized RNA and uh, sits at the end of the primer, the next nucleotide can still come in and eventually is incorporated. That is not the case with all the HIV drugs that we know with 3TC, AZT, and so forth. They are all modified at the uh, three prime position, uh, and that basically causes immediate chain termination. And um, this is how these drugs are working. So there's something different uh, going on with this drug here potentially. What is also novel is here the, the CN group at position four. Um, that was something that was not seen before. It was thought also uh, these type of compounds are not stable. What probably makes it stable here is that the base moiety doesn't contain a nitrogen here. It's a carbon and that makes it a little bit stronger as compared here to um, the natural counterpart uh, adenosine. Um, other than that, the base moiety number two here is uh, equivalent to adenosine. So remdesivir essentially is expected to behave um, like ATP. So and then uh, in my lab, um, 2015, so we go a little bit back, um, I rehired, I should say, Igor Chesnikov as a um, research associate. He was a um, grad student in my lab at McGill, a PhD student, and then he did a postdoc in New Zealand. And um, I was extremely fortunate that he um, came back to my lab. And he wanted to work on Ebola. And um, the big challenge in that, uh, in that time was, believe it or not, the polymerase, there was not a single paper that the polymerase can be expressed. So the polymerase is the target for remdesivir, but the Ebola polymerase was not expressed. And it was uh, not easy. We were not able to use conventional methods. We expressed it in insect cells and used the baculovirus system. So this is a by default a system that, that everyone is using if, if uh, protein expression in, uh, in E. coli doesn't work. 
So here he was uh, successful and uh, we looked at the mechanism of, of action of remdesivir against the purified Ebola polymerase. And, and I don't want to go into great details now. Uh, this is like what we do almost every day. We run gels with radio-labeled primers, look for RNA synthesis, throw the inhibitor in on the right side and see whether there's any effect. You can see a clear effect here. So this is RNA synthesis, and here um, is RNA synthesis inhibition in the presence of remdesivir. So there's something going on, um, but it is not at the point where remdesivir is actually incorporated that would be here. It happens a little bit later. So that's what we observed at that uh, point in time, and uh, that was published then in, in viruses in 2019. And... Um, in the same year, there was this uh, DRC outbreak, um, and um, there were actually clinical trials um, uh, or a clinical trial conducted. Um, it was a randomized trial, um, no placebo. They used ZMAP, which is an antibody, and that showed some preliminary progress in the 2014 outbreak. ZMAP was the, considered the standard of care and uh, was um, tested against remdesivir and two newer antibody cocktails. Uh, to make a long story short, the conclusion here was um, two, the two new antibody therapies were superior to remdesivir in reducing mortality. There was a little effect um, of remdesivir um, that was clear um, if one compares mortality um, um, of the entire outbreak with this particular um, clinical trial. Um, however, the two antibody therapies were uh, superior. So that was for us a little bummer because we like to work with remdesivir. It's broad spectrum antiviral and we thought, okay, um, there is really a potential also for the treatment of Ebola. But the two antibody treatments, which was, of course, a great result, um, were uh, showed really significant reductions in, in mortality, much better than remdesivir. So we went on then to the list again of the, the blueprint priority diseases and looked for other uh, viruses where we could potentially express the replication complexes and, and study remdesivir and, and perhaps also other drugs. And I mentioned already that um, coronaviruses, MERS and SARS were on the list. So there was some progress made with SARS to express the SARS polymerase, but there was no paper, nothing on, on MERS. So we thought, okay, that's a good starting point. Um, and um, a rationale for that really came if we go back again uh, in time, it's now 2016 and 17. So this is right around the time when remdesivir was uh, assessed against Ebola. Um, it was also tested against many other viruses, and it turned out not only negative sense RNA viruses like Ebola, uh, Marburg viruses, uh, uh, Nipah, and measles also, but also positive sense RNA viruses like coronaviruses, MERS and SARS, um, are inhibited by remdesivir. And you can look at the EC50s, they're actually um, pretty low, which is a, a very good sign. So below anything below one micromole of, of for a um, nucleotide analog is, is in a very good area. Um, so that provided um, an additional uh, rationale for us to express the proteins and to see whether remdesivir really inhibits the enzyme as one would predict. Um, and, uh, and, and that would allow us also to look at the mechanism of action. Another paper came out, um, a very important paper by Ralph Barrick and Mark Dennison. You've probably seen these guys. They, uh, they deserve a lot of credit in the field. Um, these are the ones who studied uh, remdesivir in cell culture um, um, in, against coronaviruses, SARS and MERS and also in, in uh, animal models. So they published a number of papers prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, and that was a terrific uh, 
basis for the clinical development of, of the compound. Um, so in this particular paper, um, they used the mouse hepatitis virus, which is a model coronavirus. They tried to select for resistance um, against remdesivir. And um, they actually picked up two mutations here. And um, these mutations are um, distant from the active site, the SDD motif here indicated. So, and, and, and also um, this is a structure, um, um, a partial structure. We did not know the entire structure and the presence of an incoming nucleotide or RNA, but um, the distance to the active site um, doesn't seem to, to indicate that there's an obvious mechanism of resistance here. So um, the level of resistance was also extremely weak. It's just uh, the IC50 for wild type is uh, 0.01. Um, it's a little bit increased with the two mutations that were identified, um, uh, just a factor of uh, five or six or so. Um, Another issue with these mutations uh, seem to be that they are compromised in regard to fitness. Um, so you can see here that uh, the uh, wild type always shows a um, um, higher values um, in terms of viral load as compared to, to the mutants. So uh, it is uh, highly likely and also not, not unusual that these resistance conferring mutations um, with, with these mutations, the virus pays a high price and uh, the fitness is uh, diminished. Um, right now, I can tell you already, resistance, there's, there's no report of, of any resistance conferring mutations in these clinical trials that have been uh, conducted with remdesivir um, against, uh, uh, against SARS coronavirus 2. So it seems as if the barrier to the development of resistance is quite high with this compound. And there is a precedent also for this, and that is for sofosbuvir uh, as a nucleotide analog inhibitor in hepatitis C. It's also extremely difficult to uh, select for resistance. So um, in my lab then, um, in 2019, um, we um, moved a little bit away from Ebola and looked for a new virus and uh, decided to work on MERS. Um, and um, Kelvin uh, Gordon, uh, he just started his, um, his uh, master studies in the lab and uh, Igor trained him to run gels and to express proteins. And uh, he looks very happy there and uh, I can tell you he's still very happy. Um, now, in December 2019, um, we all heard um, about um, um, a disease that was then uh, later referred to as uh, COVID-19 and uh, novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, um, was discovered, was the, the, the genome was deposited in the first week of January, um, which was fantastic, I should say, that allowed all of us to work immediately on that virus uh, to get our proteins or to um, synthesize the whole virus even and uh, to, to try to evaluate and assess antivirals. The WHO declare, declared on March 11th um, um, the COVID-19 pandemic as we all know. So um, at, at that point, as I, I, I already mentioned, we did not have any SARS or any antiviral agent that would work against SARS or MERS or any other coronavirus. Uh, there were a ton of ideas out there and um, people started to revisit um, um, old concepts. And I just guide you very briefly here through the life cycle of uh, coronaviruses. Um, they dock with the spike protein to the um, ACE2 uh, receptor. Obviously, this is an, a very important target here for, for antibodies quite promising antibody therapies and also a vaccine approach. Um, then eventually there's an entry uh, process. This is the uh, endosomal uh, 
um, entry pathway. There's another entry pathway, which makes it hard um, to come up with uh, with entry inhibitors. But we will see how the antibodies um, um, are doing, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, that looks seems to be a very promising um, area right now. Um, eventually, the RNA is released and uh, the virus hijacks the um, cellular translation machinery um, and viral proteins are generated, protease that um, uh, cleaves the uh, precursor proteins um, and uh, eventually um, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, synthesizes um, the template, the minus sense RNA, and then the minus sense RNA serves as a template for um, viral genome synthesis and messenger RNAs for other proteins. So um, you can attack each of these steps here, and we've heard a lot about this hydroxychloroquine here, protease inhibitors here, and here um, polymerase inhibitors like uh, remdesivir. And um, now there's, um, I think, um, a number of important publications uh, showed up um, on a weekly basis. Um, and here's one um, that was not yet with uh, SARS-CoV-2, but with MERS, and it was published in Nature Communication, Comparative Therapeutic Efficacy of Remdesivir and a combination of lopinavir, ritonavir, and interferon beta. So lopinavir was also considered as an antiviral agent against SARS, as, as many of you know. It's actually an HIV protease inhibitor. I was always skeptical because these proteases are um, entirely different, um, different mechanism of, of uh, peptide uh, processing. And, uh, um, and um, uh, it turned out also that the antiviral activity is much weaker. Here in this paper, um, remdesivir is um, with an EC50 of uh, 0.09, so quite low. And uh, lopinavir, and even boosted with ritonavir, um, it is uh, much, much higher. And um, this combination, lopinavir and ritonavir, was also dropped from um, a WHO uh, solidarity uh, trials. Um, in another paper, um, and uh, have a look at the citations here that was published in January. It's almost a thousand times cited already. Now, metric value of 7,000, which is extremely high. It's probably ranked, I don't know, maybe number one even right now. And that's the paper that it was a very simple paper, just I think one figure, letter to the editor. And uh, remdesivir uh, seems to have an antiviral effect and chloroquine um, um, as well. Uh, it turned out later on also that the cell cultures that were used here um, are probably not the best to evaluate antiviral effects. Nevertheless, it was important to demonstrate, and that's the first demonstration also here, that remdesivir um, has an antiviral effect against uh, COVID-19, and that's shown here. Um, then again in um, January, there was uh, uh, a case study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. That was the first U.S. patient, and um, it was a case study, and um, he was actually treated with remdesivir. That's why I bring that up here. That, that paper is also um, uh, quite often uh, cited. Now, at that point in time, we were also quite happy to see some positive news, but we all know now also that uh, especially um, yeah, case studies, um, it could be anecdotal evidence, as uh, Fauci also said in a different context, uh, and, and we have to look at these studies um, uh, with and interpret the data with, with caution. Um, we learned a lot over the last uh, six months. That is that is very clear, and I guess we can all agree on that. Um, in February 2020, so just a couple of weeks later, um, Amy David and uh, Heinz Feldman at the NIH 
they published a study that uh, looked at the prophylactic and therapeutic um, remdesivir treatment in macaques um, regarding MERS co-infection. And um, what they've shown is uh, the reduction of viral load in res respiratory tract uh, tissues. And what I wanted to point out here is um, this is vehicle control alone. This is prophylactic remdesivir and therapeutic remdesivir. Prophylactic remdesivir seems to work always better. So if you give remdesivir before your, your challenge, um, the viral load remains extremely low and remdesivir seems to work really pretty good. And you can see that uh, on the upper graphs as well. Therapeutic remdesivir, there's also an effect, but the timing is extremely important and the authors also refer to this. These are very important lessons also for the design also of uh, clinical trials and the, the interpretation of data uh, from clinical trials. Um, now, uh, let's get back to, to our lab and to Kelvin. Uh, it's now February, so he started September, so half a year earlier. And uh, here he is, and he published a paper in JBC. It was um, an accelerated publication. I think we submitted on a Friday, and it was accepted on a Monday or Tuesday. So that was that never happened to me before, but it was was pretty good, and Kelvin <laughs> enjoyed it. Um, and that was um, um, the um, antiviral compound remdesivir potently inhibits MERS RDRP, and we looked also at the mechanism of action here. Just um, very briefly, I don't want to go into too, too many technical details. Um, the um, construct that we used here is, is a new uh, idea, um, and it should um, resemble the situation of the entire coronavirus. There's a bunch of uh, 16 non-structural proteins, NSP proteins, and some of them are crucial for the polymerase activity. The polymerase itself is NSP12, but it really requires NSP7 and NSP8. So we express here the entire complex and we have NSP5, which is the protease, and that actually cleaves NSP7, 8, and 12. And you can capture the entire complex here. We looked at inhibition and, and also in biochemical assays, the, um, uh, IC50 values are pretty low, indicating really a potent inhibition. And uh, a little bit later, we published then the um, corresponding paper follow up with uh, the uh, SARS CoV 2 polymerase, and we had almost identical uh, results. And uh, this is here the mechanism of action. This is, this is how it works. Um, it, it's the same mechanism for SARS, for MERS, and for SARS-CoV-2. Um, RNA synthesis here, number one, is just schematically shown. The polymerase here is the uh, blue oval. Uh, the primer is in green. Um, eventually, opposite you, um, remdesivir is incorporated, but it needs to compete with ATP. And here is the first, what, what we consider as a real, um, as a really good property of remdesivir triphosphate. It competes very well with ATP. It actually is incorporated a little bit better than ATP, which is extremely rare. Um, usually the nucleotide analog is not that well uh, incorporated. The second thing then is that uh, there is no immediate chain termination. Uh, in fact, um, remdesivir goes in and then there are three other nucleotides that are still added to the growing RNA chain. And then you can see a rest of RNA synthesis. And um, we looked at this a little bit uh, closer and came up um, with a model. And um, in this model predicted that a serine at this position, 861, clashes with the inhibitor just before the primer moves into the um, fourth position. So, so that was a, a very um, specific uh, prediction. And I can tell you, we've done some site-directed mutagenesis. So we introduced smaller amino acids and we do not see inhibition anymore. So that confirms that this is really the mechanism of action and uh, that uh, 
uh, the clash between the serine at this position and the inhibitor causes the rest of RNA synthesis. Um, is this unusual? I would say yes, it is. Most um, HIV drugs, nuclear, nucleoside, nucleotides, they are chain terminators, as I pointed out. But there is a there is an exception, and that was um, you may remember that 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 story, the HPV drug entecavir, also shows. Um, some activity against HIV, which was a concern because you may select for resistance and co-infected individuals. And uh, uh, that was um, um, yeah, no, uh, a concern um, at that, that point in time. We looked at the mechanism of action and it was actually Igor also as a grad student uh, at McGill, it was in 2007. And uh, we published a paper here in it, uh, on entecavir and against HIV reverse transcriptase. And it is actually also delayed chain termination. And you see there is a three prime hydroxyl group here in entecavir as well. So, so this is exactly what we also have in remdesivir. We do have that as well in sofosbuvir, but sofosbuvir is, uh, um, uh, acts as a chain terminator. So the mechanism is different there. Um, the field we were just discussing here uh, a little bit how um, uh, um, the this, this speed, the pace um, right now in the COVID-19 field is just incredible. So there were at around the same time when we published our biochemical data, they, there were three crystal structures, cryo-EM structures coming out, um, all published in top journals, Science, Cell, and, and Nature beautiful structures, the protein with RNA, with remdesivir, incoming nucleotides, um, and so forth. So, and this is just within four months. So this, this tells you how powerful cryo-EM is. Um, in comparison, um, for HIV reverse transcriptase, the first structure of, of the polymerase was published roughly uh, with an incoming nucleotide 15 years after the discovery of, of the virus. And here it's just four months. Well, the same thing with hepatitis C. It was also roughly 15 years after the discovery. So cryo-EM is pretty powerful. Here you can see a structure. This is the incoming, this is the newly synthesized uh, double-stranded RNA. Very interesting, NSP8, the accessory factor forms interaction with the newly synthesized RNA, it seems. Um, so there's a lot going on, and I think that protein will keep us busy for, for a number of years. Um, then um, in Nature came out a paper then on remdesivir and uh, macaques, and uh, um, again, um, very similar to the data that uh, I presented uh, for MERS. So there was a very good uh, um, effect in terms of reduction of viral load. And the same was also observed here in a um, very nice paper, I think, that just came out in cell reports. Um, um, in cell culture, the ef effect of remdesivir in cell culture um, and um, in uh, a mouse model and a sophisticated mouse model. The bottom line is here what the authors found is uh, they tested different cells, different cell types. And remdesivir is um, metabolized to the triphosphate to different degrees in these different cell types. And the higher the triphosphate concentration is, um, the more potent is the antiviral effect. So that was a very important correlation and that was extremely nicely demonstrated in this uh, paper. Um, it is um, good news that also um, uh, human lung cell cultures contain high concentrations of the inhibitor. Here you can see some um, uh, therapeutic efficacy data. So, so they looked at uh, damage in, in lungs and uh, uh, viral load also and pulmonary obstructions and uh, everything looks uh, worse in the absence of remdesivir and much better in the presence of remdesivir. Um, now uh, let's leave the, the preclinical data and let's discuss briefly um, the clinical uh, data. I guess I have more, five more minutes maybe, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so there are a bunch of clinical data 
data trials, I alluded to this, uh, we started out with compassionate use and expanded access program. Um, and um, there were a lot of trials also, um, papers published and press conferences reported on trials, sometimes in full, sometimes just partially. So there were um, not only with remdesivir, with many other drugs. I mean, I've never seen that uh, with any virus before. The flood of information, and we really needed to, to, to filter this. In my personal opinion, I, I do think that um, uh, this trial here uh, by Beagle um, et al. Uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is uh, perhaps the most important trial. Um, it's a randomized um, controlled, placebo-controlled trial. Uh, um, remdesivir was tested um, um, against uh, placebo and hospitalized uh, patients. Um, many other trials are not either not random, randomized, so th there, was, there were issues with the um, study design, or it was anecdotal evidence. And then there were a number of trials also, they just didn't have the numbers also. So this one here, it's an uh, uh, NIAID-sponsored trial, is, in my opinion, highly um, uh, relevant and important. The main conclusion here is remdesivir was superior to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in hospitalized adults. So I go briefly over the data. Here's, um, I, I have some slides from Gilead. It's a disclaimer here, and please also note that this deck has been modified by myself. So don't blame Gilead. You can blame me for that. Um, this is the study design, just briefly, uh, key inclusion criteria, hospitalized patients, and they were SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR positive. They enrolled roughly 1,000 patients, one-to-one -one ratio they took over a period of uh, 10 days remdesivir or placebo, follow-up was 28 days. Um, then the outcome measures um, on an eight-point scale, um, so one non-hospitalized um, uh, to three hospitalized, but uh, not requiring any uh, supplemental oxygen. And then hospitalized, again, not requiring supplemental oxygen, but re requiring uh, ongoing medical care. Five, um, the most important with regards to, to this trial, hospitalized requiring uh, supplemental oxygen, and then six and seven is ventilation and eight eventually death. Um, so the time to recovery is defined as the first day in the 28 days of study enrollment on which a patient satisfied categories one, two, or three. So uh, gets much better from here uh, to here. Um, the um, most important result is the time to recovery. This is the medium time to recovery across all the patients. And uh, this is from 15 days uh, placebo to 11 days um, remdesivir. Um, now, this is roughly 30%. Um, Fauci said in this famous press conference, this is significant, a clear-cut clear significant um, effect. And um, of course, there was um, um, a, lo a lot of uh, comments um, um, on this um, assessment and also the way it was uh, uh, communicated. Um, uh, but I, I was, I have to say, um, impressed with this data um, because if you compare this data with drugs that are um, that are available, that are approved to treat influenza, um, Tamiflu, um, the time, um, the, the reduction in time of recovery is around 25%. So remdesivir is, is even better in that regard. So um, I think it is very clear that remdesivir based on this data is not a magic bullet. We all know that. Um, however, this data is significant, and the bar was probably a little bit too high. The expectations were a little bit uh, too high. And uh, I think uh, this data is, is very compelling, and it certainly allows us um, to build on it and um, 
eventually to make remdesivir better, to come up with better drugs, but this certainly is an antiviral um, that uh, shows an effect in the medium time. I, my apologies. We've had some technical difficulties. We're just trying to get Dr. Gote back online. But in the meantime, um, I'm actually going to ask, we, we asked offline to one of our um, newest uh, uh, faculty members, Dr. Elan Schwartz from the Division of Infectious Diseases, to just comment on uh, their experience, uh, their clinical experience um, to date in terms of trials and so on. And so he's actually been in touch with Dr. Nelson Lee and he'll give us a little update. So Ilan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you while we're fixing these technical difficulties. Sure, uh, thank you, Narman. So it's uh, it's really nice that we have the opportunity to hear from Matthias who's done a lot of the groundbreaking work with remdesivir. Uh, so uh, first of all, I don't have any uh, disclosures. Um, I accept maybe that I've been um, a bit vocally critical of uh, Gilead and some of the opacity in their um, in their publishing, particularly of the mortality data, which we're still waiting for from the uh, that remdesivir trial that uh, that Matthias had mentioned. So, um, of course, we don't yet have access to remdesivir in uh, Edmonton. Um, I've been involved primarily with outpatient trials uh, that have looked at other agents, but. The point person for us in Edmonton has been Nelson Lee, uh, who, um, as everybody knows, is a, a world expert on, uh, on coronaviruses of uh, pandemic potential. And so he is also on the steering committee of CATCO, which is the Canadian arm of the Solidarity Trial, which is the WHO-led global trial uh, looking at um, uh, therapies for inpatients of COVID-19. So remdesivir is part of uh, CATCO, um, and it has been approved from an ethics point of view here in Edmonton. However, the main uh, uh, barrier currently is that Gilead has sent their supply uh, that has been allocated for this trial to uh, the WHO, who are then redistributing it to the different participating sites uh, across the world. And uh, unfortunately, it uh, there has been some snag along the way. We don't have access to uh, to that shipment yet. And there's also, unfortunately, a lot of opacity um, about kind of where we are in that process and how far uh, away we are from getting that. That's from a, um, a clinical trial perspective. The other uh, avenue to get the drug is through Health Canada approval. And unfortunately, that also has not progressed as quickly as we would have liked uh, remdesivir has already been uh, approved in a number of different countries around the world, of course, uh, including in the States. And uh, right now, it has not been approved by Health Canada. And um, un unfortunately, there's also a lot of opacity there. Uh, we don't know uh, what is the holdup in particular. So uh, Dr. Lee is exploring other avenues to try to get the drug. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to, to access it and, uh, and use it. But as um, as Matthias uh, ha has mentioned, currently the benefit uh, that has been proven is in reducing time to recovery. Uh, we haven't yet seen a mortality improvement. We're still waiting for that 28-day mortality data uh, from the uh, the NIAID uh, study. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Lee is is really the expert and the point person here. So. Um, I'd encourage you to, uh, to reach out to him if you have any specific questions, but I can certainly try to, uh, to field any questions. So thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't hear anything what you said, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you covered um, everything, the, the clinical aspects. And uh, I think I stopped at that point where I just discussed the um, reduction in, in, in time of uh, recovery. And... Um, yeah, that is also, I don't have my slides now handy here, but I just wanted to go into some more details, but I assume that you've 
cover this. I just heard mortality, so that that remains uh, to be to be seen. Uh, Gilead put out a statement uh, recently regarding a um, retrospective study, um, and that needs to be analyzed um, and and studied prospectively. Um, uh, that is that is one point. Um, that said, unfortunately, I I don't have now access to the slides, but um, I come to the acknowledgement, um, and I would really like to thank the the people in my lab who worked uh, extremely hard um, um, in over the last couple of weeks and months to to get out the papers and um, Igor Chesnikov and Kelvin Gordon and Brendan Todd. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic job. Um, Gilead, I did mention in the beginning um, uh, uh, that uh, we received funding from Gilead for the studies um, uh, of the mechanism of action of remdesivir against Ebola and uh, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this is my conflict. I herewith uh, declare this as a, as a potential conflict. Um, and uh, they are also some of them, the Gilead folks are uh, co-authors on, on our papers. Um, and I would like to mention uh, that, that as well. Um, so with that, I think if there's still time for questions, I don't know. Um, on behalf of the department, we will answer your questions and we will address all of that when we actually post the, the um, rounds. So I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, this is the new era. And uh, would like to th sincerely thank Dr. Gote for um, presenting uh, our virtual medical grand rounds today. And stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you.